diving Hope comes and stops us in our tracks Bravely we prove in our striving Trudging together each day Hello, everyone, and welcome to Raw Recovery, a Trudging Together podcast. My name is Dion, and I will be your host today. You know, it's been a little while since we've done a podcast, and um, I'm really looking forward to a lot of the podcasts that are coming up. Um, I had three this week, but we had to do some rescheduling. Uh, You know how it is. Life goes, life is life, man. And I like to keep this show very organic and, and flowing, so... Um, it's also kind of been a rough week for me, man. So I'm looking forward to doing a podcast, getting out of myself, maybe do a little bit of healing while I'm here. So without further ado, I'd like you to introduce you to a fast upcoming good friend of mine, Amber, who has taken her time today to share her story. Thank you, Amber, for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you, Dion. Um, and I am Amber. I'm a real alcoholic. And I do want to start off uh, by saying how excited and grateful I am Aww. to be sharing with you guys today. Thank you. Um, and to have found the podcast myself, because a few of the stories that I've heard so far have definitely oh. helped me in one way or another. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the beauty of you know the aa program is yes. sharing and it, you know helping others really gets you like you said out of yourself mm-hmm. and helps you heal so yeah. um yeah to kind of start off with the, you know the beginning of my story i definitely remember um drinking from a very young age uh, okay. whether or not it was snagging drinks at the grown ups parties yep. um or just going to parties on my own. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. recently here, I remembered something that was happened when I was like 14 or 15, where I was at a uh, a garage party is what we called it. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> so, you know, and, and I remember my friend, he brought beer and he asked me if I wanted a beer. And I told him, no, I only drink hard liquor because I only drink <laughs> to get drunk. <laughs> You know, and and I was 14. like, you know, maybe when I'm maybe when I'm older, I'll enjoy the actual taste of alcohol. I'll drink it just to drink it for the taste. But no, even back then, I was drinking it <laughs> to get drunk. Um, uh, and so I didn't ever really think about it that way until I started working the AA program and thinking what, about like the alcohol. What a grown up thing to say. You know, that's yeah. a very grown. Yeah. You know, you know, I don't prefer that. I prefer the fine taste of whiskey. Thank you. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, I'm at a, you know, high school freshman garage party. Why are you bring him beer? Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and so I didn't really think about it as alcoholic thinking. I just thought of it as, you know, young teenage party <laughs> mode. Um, that was my thinking, you know, and, sure. and that thinking, stuck with me very you know into my 20s and everything like that but it stuck with me all through my teenage years too um even as a teenager i went to a high school in denver um and we would skip class constantly to go and uh you know shoulder tap which is you know standing outside of a liquor store asking someone to buy you a bottle and um that you'd buy them a beer or whatnot too if they went in and bought you that bottle and uh, I, I the school itself was in downtown Denver, so getting to you know either Colfax or yeah. uh, the Sixteenth Street Mall was really easy. Quick, yep. uh, even Civic Center Park was easy to get to. Okay. Spent lots of hours talking to random people in that park. Okay. Um, and yeah, even on days of not uh, having money, you know, it would. How do I get that next drink? How do I get yeah. that next drink? And I would literally. Uh, walk up and down the 16th street mall and ask rich people you know excuse me mister i i lost my bus money do you have a dollar for the bus yeah. granted this was when it was only 75 cents to get on the bus yep. um but i would rack up money 
Yeah, I'd rack up money and then I'd have enough to go and shoulder tap at the liquor store and it would be almost a recurring thing, yeah. whether or not it was nightly, but it was at least every weekend. I remember uh -huh. it at least every weekend, Friday, yeah. Saturday, and then I'd go back to school, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Okay. Uh, even 16, I uh, started doing online school, so I had a free schedule to, you know, I got a job, worked full time. Um, and I had one day off a week and while I was going to high school um, and on that one day off a week, I'd get off on Friday about four o'clock. So I'd have all of Friday night off and all of Saturday off and I wouldn't go back to work till Sunday about 2 p.m. Yeah. So I'd have about, you know, a good 20, 48 hours or so is yeah. how I, my mind looked at it. And so I would party hard during that time. Um about 17, I started doing go-go dancing and getting into the rave scene and okay. just a lot of other stuff, you know, and um, still drinking really heavily. And so, you know, and, and just always partying. It was just that party mentality. I like to, um, it says in the big book, you know, that we like to be the director. We like to yeah. be running the show. Sure. That was very much me. It was, okay, um what am I going to miss if I don't, if I don't go to that party? Yeah. Too? Wow. Yeah. So, been a long yeah. time since I thought of that, you know, Yeah, but I didn't want to miss out, you know, yeah. on an experience or a DJ or something, you know? And um, yeah. So the, all those things chasing the next high, chasing the next party, mm -hmm. of course, if a boyfriend couldn't keep up, that boyfriend was gone and I'd have right. another one the next day, you know, nothing really serious for a long, long time. <laughs> um, and yeah, in my early twenties, um, I turned 21. I, okay. I lost my grandfather about a month before I turned 21 okay. um, and he lived on the western slope so pretty much Utah he lived in between Grand Junction um, and mm -hmm. um, all those places up there yeah so he uh, had a house up there and you know essentially my mom was like well your lease for your apartment's about to be up you just quit your job why don't you go move up there and you know take care of the property um, oh. and find a job up there, pay me yeah. rent, this, 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 and that, you know? So I kind of took her up on her opportunity. Um, and I moved out there with a boyfriend at the time, um, our dog oh. and our cat yeah. and pretty much started a whole new life. It was, I, I grew oh. up in Denver my entire life, you know? Yeah. What, and what a switch. Yeah. It That's was, it was, a tiny tiny town it's called debec and yep, it has a population 400 people yeah yeah don't blink so it it was a total culture shock um i went to the grand junction uh area courthouse to actually get my 21 id and everything uh -huh. you know the hor horizontal id that's right <laughs> uh, versus the vertical uh because i was ready for that one of course that's right and you know so my boyfriend he was also an alcoholic he had a warrant out and so he couldn't go and uh you know get his social or his birth certificate and really wow. get a good job while he was out there so I was the one working full time. I actually was working at a bar, bartending, okay. uh, as well as waitressing. And it was a it was in um, Parachute, which is the next town over. Yeah. Um, and so I wouldn't drink on my shift. But as soon as my shift would end, I would drink. Oh, yeah. And, you know, then I started getting scared of the mountain driving while drinking. Yeah. And all that stuff. Especially, especially over there by parachute. Yeah, one road that's just Mister Windy. Exactly, and, it, and I, it's like Death Road. I forgot what they call it, but yeah, I I would close the bar about you know two a.m. and then drive by myself back to the back, and it was at least a thirty minute driver. Well, yeah. probably about twenty minute drive. Yeah, uh, but yeah. So then I started having my coworker drive me, and I told him, of course, it was the I was dishonest, right? Sure. And told him it was the fear of driving, which. It was a little it, bit, yeah. but not really. It was because I wanted to drink. <laughs> it's because you were drunk and driving, but yeah. yeah. And so, still, you know, it, still legitimate fear, though. Yes. But you know yes. what? I I appreciate, even though you were lying, I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to one hurt somebody else, but two yeah. not hurt myself. Or you know, there's so many deers and people lose their life yeah. on that highway so much. 
Um, but yeah, so that didn't help it. It didn't help that I had an alcoholic boyfriend sitting at home all day, every day drinking too. Yeah. Um, and eventually uh, that boyfriend left and man, I just kind of went into uh, one of those rabbit hole spirals where okay. you know I just, I was secluded uh, because one, yeah. I had left Denver, all of the people I knew, all the things I knew and moved to this tiny town and just secluded myself, you yeah. know? Um, I ended up, uh, you know, deciding to move back to Denver and get back with that alcoholic boyfriend and try okay. again. And, sure. you know, and, and we, I worked back at the pizza place that we were at and we were actually allowed to drink on the job at the pizza place, you know, okay. according to the owner at least. And so, <laughs> you know, it was one of those jobs where I stuck around because I could drink on the job, not yeah, because sure. I, I, enjoyed making pizza by any means um and so you know that that eventually failed epically and I had another failed relationship again Mm -hmm. after that um but the failed relationship after that actually is one of the ones that kind of was like hey you have a drinking problem you know like I've heard it before because it runs in my family. Okay. Um, my grandmother passed away from this disease. Okay. My grandfather, he didn't die from the disease, but he actually was a recovering alcoholic. Okay. He had been working the program for about 14 years. Yay. He passed away on his motorcycle in a freak accident in a rainstorm. Uh, but he died By doing what he loved. wanted to. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. And he didn't die old. He didn't want to die old. He didn't want, yeah. you know, he, he was a badass. He was in a um, oh. biker, biker crew called a uh, soldiers for Jesus. Um, and so, you know, yeah. he was a very religious guy. So him and I didn't see eye to eye on that. Sure. And of course, yeah. since he was in AA being a religious man, I thought AA was a religious program for sure. the longest time, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, so I've I have a lot of and the alcoholism doesn't only run cuz those are the two people on my mom's side. My mom's also an alcoholic. She is a uh, she's been sober for 19 years, but she does not work the program. Um so she is okay. unfortunately still in in her own hole some days. Oh, um man. so yeah, maybe someday she'll be open, honest and willing to give it a shot. Yeah. Um yeah. Because her father did it and now her daughter's doing it. And that, you know, it's all about, um, per, you know, promotion, uh, attraction, attraction, not promotion, that's you know, so my mind. Yep, exactly. So and and so at least she's sober. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely a battle. Um, And then, of course, it's on my father's side as well. And so it's it's deep in my family. Yeah. And so, you know, um, but yeah, that boyfriend, you know, he was like, I think you have a drinking problem. And of course, you know, me being in love, I'm like, oh, I'll do anything for you. I'll go to AA. <laughs> and so I, I tried it, you know, and okay. I, I kind of got scared by that God word. Um, this is sure. before COVID. So it was before um, Zoom really took off. You know, there okay. were online meetings now that I'm finding out by old timers. Like, <laughs> yes, there there were online meetings. I've but been you going through... Zoom for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it was like through AOL Messenger and stuff like that. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, but yeah, anyways, it was an in-person meeting that I originally went to. And so I got scared by the hand holding praying the god word mm. the fact that they uh, had the rule or not the rules but the steps up on the wall on a yeah. big poster and in my mind i was like those are rules you know i was sure barely 21 i'm like man i just got legal drinking don't take this away from me but i do <laughs> need to stop for a while yes yeah. you know so so i did stop for about a year on my own um okay. actually decided you know I cleared my thoughts in my head, realized how um, bad that relationship really was for me, even though, yes, he did help me to an extent. Um, So I ended up, you know, getting my own apartment for the very first time. I had always had uh, roommates or um, couch hopping, all sorts of different shit. When when Uh, you're a drinker, that's how you live. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. When you are a drinker, having your own place is not your uh, it's not a very good idea. goal. 
No. Yeah, exactly. Because you're already lonely, you know, you're already yeah. lonely. So yeah, yeah, I'm now seeing that, that I surrounded myself by people constantly. Um, and so yeah, even as a child, I actually would go, I have a brother that he's closest in age to me. He's eight years okay. younger than me, though. All and I right. go in like, when he was like four or five, I'd go crawl into his bed at night because I was afraid of dying alone. So uh, that's like, that's how severe sometimes the alcoholic yeah. thinking gets and how early it is when you're born with this disease. That's, it was like, that yeah. was how I wasn't even drinking at that time. And that's how lonely I yeah. felt, you know? I, I agree. I mean, when I look back, I was always a lying little manipulative shit. I was always. Yeah. I have never, until I got into AA, understood what honesty actually was. I thought yeah. I had it down. I was so wrong. You're like, you're brutally honest. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm that honest. That's not good honesty. <laughs> That's taking people's inventories. That's what brutal honesty is. So, yeah, exactly. Being too blunt sometimes isn't yeah. just good honesty. I, and that's how I am as well, very yeah. much. You know, so yeah, I get my own place and I kick the boyfriend out and I'm doing really good. And, <clears throat> you know, things are since then, things have gone good. I can tell you that, you know, even yeah. though I've had my 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 flow of things. Um, but that's really when I started to think about it in a different way. Like, OK, yeah, there is something else going on here than just party Amber teenager you know mm -hmm. and so um i stayed sober for a year i decided um you know things were good that i could i was barely 22 23 yeah uh, yeah i think i was 23 at that time okay. and i'm like okay i can do controlled drinking you know i wasn't working the program didn't know about progression didn't know about all these other tools didn't know about the phenomenon of and maybe craving. it was a stage you know Maybe you were just exactly going through, the, through the stage. Exactly. I thought it was the stage. And I also thought I could not be the alcoholic that That's my mom, right. my dad, and all these other people were. You know, I was successful. I was I graduated high school all through yeah. online high school while working are, full time. Are you the oldest? I am, okay. yes. I kind of yeah, my, my you sound like dad, the, you sound like the hero of the family also. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am at this point now the monarch of the family um, on my mom's side because she has a lot of mental disorders and my okay. uncle just passed away back in November. Um, and so he pretty much passed that down to me. Uh, okay. So, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting, interesting ride of sobriety this time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I went out, tried some controlled drinking, was successful ish for about nine months, but still okay. could not control it. And essentially, towards the end of that nine months, I was uh, working at uh, an escape room, and I was essentially the manager of the escape room okay. where I had, I, I would, and I didn't have a set schedule. It was all based on bookings, right? So, like, if somebody uh, that makes sense. only one or two bookings throughout the day, then I would go in during that time, and I'd yeah. have the rest of the day to myself, um, but that also led to a lot of self-destruction because yeah. i was alone at the escape rooms all the time yeah and there was a liquor store right next door yeah. so i was always, got, to, got to know I, bob next door at the liquor store real well didn't you <laughs> yeah yep and so you know it was one of those things where it was like i just would go to the liquor store and drink okay. on the job and then unfortunately drive home um, and so one of those nights that I drove home, though, I decided I was going to go to the King Supers, um, and dinner and bring dinner home. And in between King Supers and home, I blacked out and ended up wrecking my car, um, into a parked car in Denver. Okay. So luckily, oh, hold on. I'm getting another call. There we go. And so luckily I didn't hit a person or, you know, a, a car with people in it or anything like that. Like yeah. seriously, my higher power, I, I consider my higher power, my ancestors, my guardian angels. Yeah. So in my mind back then, I'm like my guardian angels, they helped, you know, but I also realized, okay, nobody's hurt. 
So I have a bunch of pissed off Denver people because they came out of their houses and stuff like that. And I was like, well, I'm not going to deal with this. So I, I ran. Oh, you took off. Okay. I took off. And so um, I did end up getting picked up by the police. And I don't really remember getting picked up by the police officer yeah. necessarily. But I do remember telling the officer that, no, I wasn't drinking while driving. I wasn't going to breathalyze for him. You know, just just totally not being cooperative at okay. all you know and then of course ending up in the drunk tank at detox yeah. and not being cooperative with them and finally sobering up enough to the point where you know they tell me well we're not gonna let you go upstairs with the other people until you breathalyze and then you sober up and we let you go yeah so then i'm like okay well now i really want a fucking cigarette and so yeah. i'm like oh okay, well, breathalyze <laughs> me you asshole and so I get breathalyzed, I go upstairs, I don't eat food, I don't do any of the things that they tell me to do. Yeah. And then, you know, they're like, well, it's time for you to go. And I'm sitting there thinking I got off, you know, scot-free, just had to spend a night in fucking detox. And then, right. no, the lady shows me my tickets because they don't show you your tickets until you get out. Until you leave because it's in your property. Exactly. Yep. And I didn't get a DUI uh, ticket, but I did oh. get a uh, ticket for leaving the scene and I got a ticket for reckless driving. Okay. Um, which would have been more points than a DUI anyways. So I would have been essentially losing my license if I would have gotten stuck with both of those. Sure. Um, and I knew what was coming. So I sobered up. I went back to AA again. Yeah. Um, and I also lawyered up because I just well, I had the money at least at that point because okay. I worked my ass off, you know? Sure. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't, it didn't go well with the boyfriend after that, of course, because sure. I, I was still dating the same guy that I did the year. Um, yeah. And not he the, was already not the one, concerned. Not the one that told me you have a drinking problem, right? Oh. That's the one, that's the one I kicked out, but I, I actually started dating my current boyfriend, his name is Scott. Okay. And mm. Scott and I have actually known each other for like 13, 14 years yeah. now at this point. Okay. And so we've known each other through that party high school scene. Yeah. And like, that's how we know each other. Is and, it's the part, and he knows you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He, so, he, you know, he, he knows the real Amber. Yeah. So he got to see me sober there for like the last six months of that year. And then he got to see me drink for the nine months. He got okay. to see me wreck my car. He picked me up from detox. Um, and he made me, you know, of course, promise him that I was going to stop drinking and sure. get help and all that stuff. And so and you I did. Met it. You met yeah, it. And I did. I, I, I did. And so I went and like I said, I went to D uh, uh, AA again. And this time I ended up at the Arid Club off of like 10th and uh, Wadsworth. Wadsworth I think. Yeah. Yeah. 10th and Wadsworth. And you know, I was going in a little bit more open minded that time. Yeah. You know, not not as close minded as the first time. But still that God word and holding hands and praying. Sure. I was just like, man. Yeah. You knew what to expect this time. Yes, yes, I knew what to expect. And I definitely went a lot longer than the first time. Okay. Um, but I still didn't go long enough to one, get a sponsor or two, read the big book or even learn the steps, you know, mm. I still didn't even learn about progression that blows my mind that I still was just in in that big of a delusion that I still didn't even hear the word progression at one of these meetings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, yes, I left again and I decided I was going to do it all on my own. But at that point, yes, I had decided that I was an alcoholic. And so I stayed sober for three years for that one um, okay. without any help. Uh, but during that time, I was very, very irritable, restless and discontent. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't like that first year that I did of sobriety, you know, it was like I they you know, I hate the word pink cloud, but that's really kind of how it was because it was yeah. my first time in 10 years being sober yeah. for a year. Um, and then the second time of being sober that first year, same thing. It was like, oh my God, I didn't get a DUI. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to court and everything. Anyways, I got the lawyer, dyed my hair blonde. So I looked like an innocent little girl and, uh, the, <laughs> you know, I did all this shit. Yeah. And so, um, 
yeah, I, the lawyer ended up getting me a good deal, which probably in my case, I should have gotten the bad deal. So that way I would have hopefully learned a lesson. Okay. But at this point, you know, I, now that I've worked the steps, I totally 100% agree with that line from the big book, you know, uh, you won't regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. You there know, it, is. for the longest time, I was like, man, that judge should have nailed me. I would have stayed sober. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have stayed sober. I no, you, it, it, yeah, shit. the same thing would have happened. Yeah. Except but it would yeah, have been but, worse. Yeah. But so for that three years, you know, the first year was good because all I got out of that ticket, um, they dropped the... Uh, leaving the scene ticket okay. so all i got was the careless driving ticket so it was okay. only four points yeah. so i got to keep my license i had to do 20 hours of community service which i ended up fucking doing at my uncle's elk lodge which yeah. is literally beer haven yeah. if anyone knows what an elk well, lodge you did is was hang out for yeah hours. i wasn't i wasn't drinking but i was literally just hanging out yeah, exactly yeah I, yeah <laughs> so, i paid i i paid somebody to do my community service hours for me. Yep. See, you know what it is. I also, I, I paid someone to do my math on online school because yeah, math on online does not make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> that dishonesty, you know, That's it, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And so the first year was good because I was like, man, I didn't get fucked by the judge. I'm sober again. Um, and I actually got pregnant too. Okay. And we were expecting, you know, we were trying, we weren't expecting it because we had actually been trying for quite okay. a while and it happened. And so then, you know, that was even more reason to stay sober. Um, I had, uh, I had to quit smoking cigarettes. So that was extremely hard, white yeah. knuckling it, not smoking cigarettes and being pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was just, yeah, pregnancy was very difficult. And then I also had um, actual pregnancy difficulties. I had okay. preeclampsia and yeah. they ended up having to induce me. Yeah. And so it was a lot of, and my son spent five days in the NICU because he was only four pounds. Wow. He was completely okay. healthy. Thank yeah. God he was completely healthy. Um, but it did end up being an emergency C-section, um, you know, just doctors, the, all the doctors, the entire process just seemed to not really care. We just yeah. felt like we were treated like another number too. Yeah. Um, so after that, you know, I came out of that with a lot of PTSD, of course, didn't want to drink still because I was a new mom knew that that wasn't a good sure. idea, but I did want to smoke cigarettes and I started fucking sneaking cigarettes from my boyfriend and it mm -hmm. turned into this huge fight because I was breastfeeding and things like uh that. And yeah. so, you know, it, it was just like if I would have been sneaking alcohol, though, just yeah, like that, just, you know, it's the same behavior. Yeah, exactly. And of course, yeah. I didn't realize that until now when I've been working the steps and stuff like that. Now I'm yeah. seeing my side of the street. I'm just <laughs> like, oh, I'm not. Yeah, we I'm got not. a little kid. I'm going to play with the kid. Oh, <laughs> Can I say hi? Say hi. 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 What's your name? Isaac. Wow, Isaac. How old are you? Me. You're three? three. Wow. Uh, I'm 52. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're a cutie, Isaac. Thank you for thank, thank you. you for saying hi. Yeah, good job. Are you playing? Good. Um, yeah, so I got pregnant with him. He came along and I snuck the cigarettes, but then I put those back down again, too. Um, and then, you know, I did decide that, um, I don't know, after about two and a half years of sobriety, I decided, well, maybe I can drink like a normal person someday again. Yeah. Right. But but to be completely honest with you, I actually and everyone that'll be listening to this, I guess. <laughs> but I had that reservation that someday I would have a drink at, let's say, my yeah. wedding. Lurking right? notions. Yes. The lurking notion. It yeah. was never like, oh, if somebody dies, okay, because mm -hmm. I've lost a lot of fucking people yeah. and most of them because of alcohol. So it's not like that ever went through my mind, but it was like my wedding, um, certain yeah. occasions like that, right? It's, it's the happy occasions that actually get us. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I had that reservation. I had that lurking notion, which once again, I still didn't know the big book. So I didn't know this. And so yeah, I, my somehow my brain, it talks about it in the big book, you know, how we're going to forget the suffering, the humiliation yeah. from oh, even a yeah. day, a week, a month, all that ago. Yeah. And yeah, that's exactly what my brain did. My brain forgot totaling my car, going to jail, yep. going to all this stuff. Um, and yeah, the fights, yeah, the dishonesty, all of it. And so, you know, um, at, at two and a half years, I was like, well, you know, at it, it, my three year mark, I'm not going to go out and drink on my three year mark. But after three years, I'll be cured. I'll be able to drink like normal Oh, yeah. People. Once you have that chip, you're like, yeah, I did it. And yeah, chip. you know, and I wasn't even actually getting chips. Think. And yeah, it's so natural, isn't it? Doesn't feel oh yeah, that's natural. Da di da di da. Yeah, and I've heard of it in a different um from someone else that you know we give ourselves rewards that we like mm -hmm. to reward ourselves, and then she like uh made it seem like we were puppies, and it made me laugh yep. like we're we're gonna get a little treat because we stayed sober for two months. Right. You know, give me, give me a treat. Give me a treat. <laughs> exactly um so yeah after that three years about a month or so after that three years around fourth of july actually i think it was i went back out um and it didn't you know it wasn't anything bad i never went out and wrecked another car um but you like you you emphasize the fights the yep. fights started happening again um and i've known scott for so long we've been best friends for this long yeah. we shouldn't be fighting like this you exactly. know um, so, and then of course, you know, me not being present for Isaac, not being present for our animals. We have two cat or, well, we didn't have two cats while I was drinking, but we have two dogs. We have okay. a hamster, we have fish. So we have things and we have goals too. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're starting to slack on our goals. Scott and I actually run a company together as well. Okay. So, we work together. We live together. We do everything together. Isaac, yeah. when he's not at preschool, he's with us. Um, you know, so it was one of those things where it was like, I was not present for anyone. Yeah. And I didn't want to kill myself. But during that time of drinking, I was out drinking and it was harder to put the drink down this time too. Yeah. Um, and it, in the line came up quicker than before. I yeah. started sneaking drinks quicker than before. Mm -hmm. Um, our agreement was when I did go back out drinking that I was only supposed to be drinking seltzers. And okay. of course I'd be sneaking vodka into my seltzers. Yeah. Like the progression, that progression. And, and I it, thought it, and it's fast too. Yeah. And I thought it was all because I was having to, I was having somebody control my drinking, yeah. not because of progression, <laughs> not because of me wanting more and more and more. I thought it was just because of oh, I had to drink this much before he noticed, yeah. you know, things like that. And that, that alcoholic delusion that we're really fucking in. Yeah. And I heard, th I heard this in a meeting. I think it was this morning too, where, you know, we would, I would, I would make up things in my head where like, you know, if I took a drink or two drinks, but if nobody saw it, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't fucking happen. And I would yeah. lie my ass off yeah. like I did with that cop. To the point where you really can't prove it unless you breathalyze me, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, which is unfortunate, you know, and that that's actually something that came up on the last day of my drinking was, um, you know, it was at that point I was lying about the alcohol and um, putting our son in danger. And right. uh, I that night I had, you know, of course. Um, so that day, actually, 11, 11. I went and saw my uncle in the hospital because he had um, tumors mm -hmm. on his Is this his the spine. one that just recently passed? Okay. Yeah. And he had mm -hmm. tumors on his spine and on his liver. They didn't Ooh. know about the one on his liver, but they knew about the one on his spine when I went yeah. to go see him. Um, and he went in because he was having back pain. And this guy is one of the types of guys, he does construction, he does okay. like interior, you know, modeling and stuff like that. And so he's a hard worker. Um, and he worked through most of it, right? And just yeah. chalked it up to back pain, didn't go to the doctor, didn't care for it, take care of himself. Um, and so, 
Yeah. So I went and saw him on 11, 11 of 2022 and, you know, it was really hard seeing him like that. I could see yeah. this very strong man, just very sick in bed, you know, pale, all that Withering stuff. Away. And yeah. And, um, I drank on my way to the hospital down to Denver. And okay. then of course, after I saw him, I drank, of course, too. I, I actually stopped at the liquor store yeah, on yeah, Broadway. Uh huh, on Broadway, and I don't know, South Broadway somewhere. And I stopped okay. and got sh shooters and drank them right there in the parking lot and fucking drove all the way back to Broomfield. And um, before I came home, I got more shooters and, you know, of course, lied to my boyfriend about that, too. And yeah. It was just really bad. And, you know, he could tell that I had been drinking and I just, of yeah. course, kept. They always I, know. It's everyone we knows. Well, yeah. he's known you for 14 years. He, yeah. knew the, he knew the second it touched your tongue. Exactly. Like, yeah. He did. And, um, yeah. And then I kept blaming it on, you know, my uncle being sick and all this stuff. And, sure. uh, you know, what was really odd and I still still think it's odd to this day and I'm, I'm sure I'll get something out of it eventually but my uncle is not a religious guy either like he I at least know that there's like a higher power and stuff like that and but he was like no 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 uh, yeah. he had been sober for 10 years but would not touch the AA program because he thought it was religious yeah um, and so but he he really helped everyone around him like he used his skills to go and remodel people's houses like I could probably list off 10 people that when he passed away they were like my your uncle redid my bathroom or my kitchen or yeah. this and I'm gonna have to look at his work every day now and think about him and I'm like well I have to look that's, at his possessions service what do you right think there yeah, so he did service work in his own way, and that's what kept yeah. him happy, joyous, and free, okay? And a lot I've of people him... do that, and it's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, but he yeah. didn't even realize it, or maybe he did, I don't know. Um, so that's <laughs> how he stayed sober for 10 years um, and died sober as well. Yeah. And uh, But anyways, the chaplain, the weird part about it, the chaplain came into his room and before he thought, before anybody thought he was dying, right? I just went to go see him in the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> but the chaplain came in and when she came in, my heart sank. I knew something wasn't right. Yeah. I knew they don't send in the chaplain just for no fucking reason. And I called right. immediately like, my uncle Sean was like, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to go to hospice. I'm going to be fine. Don't worry. I'm going to be fine. This was on a Friday, right? Yeah. And then Saturday I was detoxing. Sunday, I believe I went and saw him. Or maybe I was still detoxing that day too. Um, but I think it was Monday. You know, Monday we for sure got the call that he was only had a couple days left. Yeah. And that he did have liver cancer and that it was not good. Um, and so his daughter is actually six months older than me. And my okay. uncle Sean, uh, she, uh, my uncle Sean, her dad was our soccer coach, our softball coach. He taught me how to rollerblade. He, he taught me a lot of shit in life. Um, we have a cabin up in Conifer that our great, great grandparents built he taught me how to properly take care of the cabin. He's taught me a lot of life stuff, right? Um, and so I immediately, Ariel and I, we've been best friends growing up too. But that escape room that I was working at, that I was also drinking at, she stayed on when I decided to leave. And me being stuck in my alcoholic thoughts, I was pissed off at her for not leaving too. Yeah. <laughs> and it caused this huge <laughs> fight. Yeah. We hadn't talked for like a year and a half. And we were like sisters growing up, you know? And so uh, when Uncle Sean, you know, when we got that call that he only had a couple days left, her and I literally set everything aside and just was there for him. And yeah. that day was you know, it was very interesting, but we hugged and we, you know, we didn't like talk about our issue, but it was yeah. like, okay, we need to move forward yeah. for the better of the family, you know? Yeah. And so uh, that, yeah. And he passed away on Thursday. So we 
you know, he, he, he went into the hospital on November 5th and died on the 17th. So okay. 12 days is 12 days. how quickly, but like yeah. I said, he never went to the doctor who knows yeah. how long he really had this. Um, but you know, it was one of those really, it was a fucking shocker for us. It sure. really was. He was only 54. Um, so it was, it was hard. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, my mom, you know, she deals with a lot of stuff. My uncle Sean was her rock. He also financially helped her. And since he's died, uh, she's pretty much crawled under a rock and yeah. not talked to anyone. Um, she. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, um, it's she uh, also. Uh, Sean. On, I mean, he's been talking about what he wants what he wanted what passed down to for a while okay. like for example like ariel gets his you know savings in his car and yeah. whatever else he can sell and he's been talking about this for years now too which kind of made us think maybe he knew something was going on yeah maybe um, he didn't know. and so and ariel she's never gonna have kids and i have a kid and the only other one that the cabin would get passed down to would is my brother Dylan, and he's mm -hmm. barely twenty one. Um, yeah. So Sean, and I'm the only one that ever goes up to the cabin and yeah. takes care of it and stuff like that too. So Sean has been talking about it for five years now that he's going to pass that down to me, and so he did on his deathbed. He laid this out to me, Sean, or me, Ariel, and my mom. Okay. And my mom gets our grandfather's house out in Quebec. Like yeah. the house was the both of theirs and now it's just hers. So okay. he, you know, we each got something. It's not like my mom got sure. in, nothing. Um, but in all reality, you know, my mom, when I was drinking for that year and a half, I never once told her I was drinking, yeah. uh, but I, she never asked either. And she didn't, she never was around enough to realize that I was drinking either. Uh, she doesn't come and visit Isaac much. She, you know, it's just one of those things where if she would have been present herself, uh -huh. she would have seen it, you know? Yeah. And so instead, she's now mad at me that I lied to her um, and that I shouldn't get any of the things that Sean has left to me. Yeah. Um, even though Sean knew that I was drinking uh, and he and I had a really heart to heart talk on, you know, the 11th. And I, you know, I not only did coming home and, you know, my boyfriend smelling it on me and him, he actually mm -hmm. called his dad, our best uh, friend, Chris, oh, oh. and uh, his mom. <laughs> and they all did an intervention on me that night. Yeah. And, you know, so, but it, it worked, you know, and it went, it went shitty. It fucking for was you. shitty. <laughs> it, for me. <laughs> And I wasn't nice to them, so I'm sure yeah. it was shitty for them, too. Yeah. But, you know, I've at least made one amends. So, well, actually, two amends out of those four people so far okay. with my step work, you know. Yeah. So I'm working on it. Um, but, you know, it... are, are <laughs> they're hard as heck. I mean, yes. there's no way around it. And I'm not going to sit here and pick on your interventions. So, but. Um, yeah. That's it, always it was a good needed. start. And it worked. You said it worked. Yeah, it, it was needed because, you know, it, it meant a lot for, okay, I know my boyfriend loves me. He can tell me not to drink until his fucking face is blue, right? Sure. But it meant yeah. a lot that both of his parents were here when, you know, obviously my mom's not very present. Um, yeah. My dad is, my dad is present, but he's in Maine. So he can't really do a ton you know yeah um and so it was very heartwarming and eye-opening to see that people did care and i think that was like one of the first times in a long time that i didn't feel alone yeah and i was like okay there's there some fucking hope here there's yeah. some hope here and i've put down the bottle before but i know i'm an alcoholic let's try aa you know and so um, the next morning, I woke up feeling like dog shit, you know, so that was yeah. like 12, woke up feeling like dog shit. And uh, I don't know, I just, my boyfriend thought I was going to lay in bed all day and, you know, be hung over and probably drink <laughs> again and stuff like that. And so sure. he yelled at me, you know, get out of bed. You're not laying in bed all day. You know, today is day one and like Sergeant Drill, Drill yeah. Master, you know, and 
uh, you know, we also talked about, um, cause since I had tried AA before, you know, he didn't think that it was going to work. So he really wanted me to go to, you know, detox or, um, a, uh, like an inpatient place, you know, sure. rehab. So I did look into it. Um, and the rehab place that I called was here in Broomfield. And, you know, they asked me a shit ton of questions and pretty much determined via phone that I could detox on my own. Um, and so I, I did and I detoxed for the seven days. And during that seven days, I was going to AA meetings constantly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like yeah. I said, that morning, yeah. I was actually laying in bed, I had for some reason, just like Googled online meetings. Yeah. And I think I figured because of uh, COVID that there had to be something. more online meetings, yeah. something. Yeah. And so um, I Googled it and it, it was at like six 30 in the morning on a Saturday. Yep. And I uh, found, I think it was the interlock or inner group website. And mm, then yeah. of course, you know, I'm scrolling and I see a meeting and I clicked on it. And it was actually, of course, because nine times out of 10, when you go on there, you're going to end up in a meeting that's actually not even in your state. Correct. But <laughs> it was the Alano Club over there off of like 54th and um, yeah. like in Wheat Ridge. Yeah. And they do a hybrid meeting. Yep. And so I ended up in, an, in a Denver meeting at 7 a.m. on a Saturday yeah. in a hybrid meeting. And of course, it was a very well established group where they're holding hands in the hybrid meeting. But I'm like sitting here on Zoom world, like, okay, I don't have to do that at least yep. this time. Um, but I, I do like praying now. I can at least say that, you know, I yeah. do pray now that I've worked the steps because I have found my own higher power. Yeah. Um, and so, but of course, I, I just, I didn't want to let it rub me the wrong way this time. So I just kept being open-minded and honest and willing. And I also did not trust women when I came into this program, yep. my mom and being one of the biggest factors. Um, but a lot of other women in my life, it's just typically I can trust the men in my life more than the women. And yep. so I came in scared shitless that I had to get a woman sponsor and that I was going to have to work with like some emotional sappy person or something like that, that wanted to be my therapist and, mm -hmm. you know, dissect my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I, I'm not a feeling person very much. I am more now that I am working the steps because I, that's something that, you know, is one of my causes and conditions is that yeah. I bottle up all my feelings. Uh -huh. And so I can't bottle up all my feelings anymore. But I'm also not a super sappy person either, you know? Yeah. And so uh, anyways, yeah, about mm -hmm. day two or three, um, I was sitting in a meeting and this woman was talking about, you know, our sponsor. And then she happened to say him or he or whatever. And, yeah. you know, talked about how her sponsor was a man. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what? What? What rule? Where was the rule? And then, of course, you know, I actually start asking people with time and they're like, there's no rule in the big book. It's yeah, just something that it's just something that kind of is what it is, but it's not set in stone. You can work with a man. As long yeah. as you work with a sponsor, you're good to go. I'm, I've sponsored women before. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so um, it's not like I went out looking for a man, but just that little bit of hope gave me hope to look for a sponsor. Yeah. To, open up to somebody and, you know and it and, does say in the big book that it only takes a little bit to do that so yeah you did it right you did exactly. exactly how i told you to do it in the big book yep and so you know i started uh going to more meetings so that i could meet more people hear more people's stories mm -hmm. stuff like that um i eventually was on at our time it's 11 a.m it's called um no rules no drama okay and it's an okay uh, meeting. It's very free flowing, no time limits and stuff like that. But it also doesn't really have like a topic starter. So okay. it, it kind of sounds like, like celebrate recovery more than it does AA. But... Yeah, exactly. Which is um, great. But that's, that just happens to be the meeting that I found my sponsor in. And it's not okay. a meeting that him or oh, I go to regularly either. Yeah. Uh, it's just the universe connecting two people, you know. And he went on there and he shared his hope or his strength, experience and hope. 
Um, and he talked about how he got sober at 23 and how he, you know, had, had gone through all this shit and done it on his own for a while. And then finally, you know, he met up with, uh, just this dude that taught him the steps in such a simple, logical yeah. way that worked for him and yeah. then not only taught him the steps but also gave him a manual yeah. to teach those steps exactly how he learned those steps and so you know that that's what caught my mind was like wait a minute okay you got a manual for these steps <laughs> you, you got sober around the same age as me yeah um i think he's about 10 years older than me so he's not my age um, but he's got like 16 years of sobriety, which just yeah. blew my mind for somebody <laughs> under 40, you yeah. know? And so, um, yeah, you know, and that was one of the groups that it wasn't like you could message everyone or private message people. You had to message mm -hmm. the co-host and then yeah. hope that the co-host mm -hmm. sees it and messages them. And yeah. it, it, it worked though. I got his, you know, uh, cool. either he got my number or I got mm -hmm. his number and we called each other right after that meeting and we just talked for a little bit and he got me started on what we get our sponsees started on which is we call them our action tips and then mm -hmm. three suggestions um and the action tips are actually really going through the first couple of you know detox days too but then it moves forward uh you know so number one call another alcoholic so get phone numbers you know yeah. so from day three my sponsor was having me get other people's numbers and yeah. getting out of myself uh go to a meeting share yeah. what's on your mind you know mm -hmm. yeah number three read the big book uh mm -hmm. four make gratitude five exercise and that could be you know walking swimming running or just simply going outside okay um number six eating chocolate uh soda candy sugar and yeah. then number seven he actually has on here call the central office for your area um so i have the denver central office on here i have a sponsee in uk she looked up her number and put it on her stuff like that um, and then the first three suggestions are pretty simple suggestions. Call your sponsor once a day so yeah. that you can make the call yeah. when you actually need it. Yeah. And at first, you know, before he said, so you can make the call when you need it. I was like, oh, my God, you're going to be a babysitter. I don't you know, I don't need to call you every day, you know. <laughs> and then as soon as he said, so you can make the call when you need it. Yeah. I just like a light went off in my head, you know. Yeah. And then also, of course, integrity, doing what you say you will, consistency ensures quality of life. Um, number two is to go to a meeting every day. And then number three is to get a large big book. And what I mean by large big book is, you know, the first part of the book, the 164 pages, as well as the stories in the back. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, for me, I didn't even really, I knew that I was missing something, but I got sure. my grandfather's AA book. So I have a third edition. Whoa. And then I also <laughs> have, I have a tiny little pocket book too. Yeah. yeah. And the pocket book doesn't have the stories in the back. No, so that's just 164. That's, exactly so you know i love this one i love all three of my big books they're all written in at this point because of course i had to get myself a regular fourth edition as well yeah. so, we um, keep so that, yeah so that just that was such a mm -hmm. you know an educational moment on day three like he actually finally explained my big books to me yeah. um i also had like the 12 and 12 from my grandfather um, I also have the, uh, it's actually an Alano book, but it's like pretty much their daily reflection book. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was, I thought it was our reflection book. And then when I showed it to him, he's like, no, that's Al-Anon. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, well. <laughs> it's still yeah, I read Al-Anon daily to reflection too. I, I read yeah. their re daily reflections. It helps. Yeah. Me, it helps me work with other alcoholics. Exactly. And I mean, it helps me too with my own, you know, past yeah, experience with the alcoholics in my family. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, my sponsor, he just laid it out on paper for me, gave me instructions, 
Um, and everything in our manual is all in the big book as well, too. Um, yeah. So, you know, he'd give me um, a part to do. And I would if I had a question or something, I could go back to my step journal and read what he gave me. Yeah. And if I still had questions, then I could call him, you know, yeah. but it was nice. And then when now that I'm sponsoring people, I'm giving them exactly what he gave me. That's it. And, and now that I go to the sponsorship family, uh -huh. um, it's, it's kind of crazy. We have a once a month uh, meeting and the everybody in this meeting all has the same manual. So we talk about it like everybody knows about it because yeah. we all know about it. Not and it's secret. just so <laughs> it's not a secret. No, it's just so amazing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at, at first, my relationship with my sponsor was like, you know, I felt awkward. And sure. I felt like, you know, maybe I couldn't trust him. Um, but then I started thinking like, well, I have no reason not to trust him. First exactly. of all, he's just, he's two States away from me. First of all, I'm in Colorado. He's yeah. in California. Um, and he knows nothing about me. Um, and you know, yeah. it, slowly we started, you know, building a relationship. Yeah. Um, the first anyways, two, when I meet with a sponsee, mm -hmm. I'll meet with them a couple of times before we start doing any work. Because what if they exactly. don't like me? What if I, exactly. And that's happened to me before. Dion, I just don't, I'm not connecting. And so I go help them find another sponsor. Good. That's Yeah, I love that. And that's, well, that's how it I? should be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My phone is dying, but I'm still here. Um, so, okay. <laughs> you know, with, with finding somebody like that and then... Um, when I got to doing my 10th step, he uh, introduced me to his sponsor, which is my grand sponsor. Mm -hmm. And our grand sponsor is in Florida. And our grand, my grand sponsor reminds me a lot of my belated grandfather. Yeah. So it's just, he left me uh... a voicemail. I was actually doing a lead for a me meeting and he left me a voicemail the first time he ever called. Yeah. And it just like almost had me in tears because Aww. we're not alone, you know, just the beauty yeah. of this program. We're not alone. Um, and like that was, you know, it wasn't wrecking a car or even the intervention, you know, the intervention really did help. Yeah. Um, but it was the fact that I was just felt so alone yeah. um, and just so defeated those were the words that I knew before I came to AA, right? That's how yeah. I could describe it. But now that I know the big book pretty well, I like to go to the page on 152 where it talks about someday he will be unable yeah. to imagine life either with alcohol or without it. Then he will know loneliness such as few do. He will be at the end, the jumping off place. He will wish for the end. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I misread that last sentence, that, but that's okay. It still says the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was at that jumping off place. I was looking for the end, even though I had a lot of things to live for. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. So, you know, um, he walked me through the steps fairly quickly um, before going through the first uh, three steps. We do like to have our sponsees read. Um, up to the first 63 yeah page 63 second paragraph uh -huh. um, or listen to it because of course during detox and shoot I couldn't even read for the first month of sobriety because I just could not yeah. focus I couldn't um, talk or walk I had to relearn exactly we have yeah. to really recreate our lives is what yeah. it says um, and yeah so I you know we give option to listen to it which the everything aa app you know that's an amazing app for me because that's how i listen to the yeah. book um, um i love that app the only thing that i don't like about it is the counting of days okay um it, it does count it kind of odd well it isn't that it gives you a it gives you a chance to celebrate you know uh 142 days and that's not a celebratable in our in it, and we we the reason we have my, that we have good reasons for those milestones yeah. because if I'm celebrating just because I'm sober today, which is nothing to scoff at, don't get me wrong, okay. But our success can't be time, time because 
Time doesn't matter. It's a day to time. And if you got up before 1130 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, you have more sobriety than me today. And that's how I look at it. So, um, but other than that, I love that app. It it um, it was very much needed. Yes. Yeah. No, and I, I agree with that too. I agree with the milestones and a lot of the things that were created in AA because there is a reason for those things. Yep. Um, you said too, you know, um, the a lot of the slogans in AA is, you know, the 24 hour slogans and one day at a time, uh, keep yeah. coming back, things like that. But I think the most the one that hit me the hardest and it's not even a slogan. It's just something that a sober friend said was, you know, um, you and I are exactly the same. And this is somebody that has 39 years of sobriety, but she looked, she looked me dead in the eyes and said, you and I are exactly the same. If we pick up a drink today, we're dead. Yeah. And that's what really. Yeah. Um, And so she's, Everybody's scorecard reads zero, is what we're saying. Yeah, we are all yeah just as clear. It de- and time doesn't matter. It doesn't. Yeah, time it- is our enemy. And then she also said that um you know all we have is today. Sit. So I I like that one. All I yeah. have is today. Yeah. Um, and that really helps me stay out of my head, you know, and the fact that I don't have a time machine, right? Exactly. The mind is the only thing that can time travel on the human body yeah. is the mind, <laughs> right? So if I, like I, if I think about the past, right, I'm going to dwell on the past. And if yeah. I think about the future, I'm going to worry. I'm going to have anxiety. I'm going to do all yeah. those things. So, yeah, I truly – don't get me wrong. I plan things because that we have to plan things still. Sure. Um, but, no, I'm not going to worry about who's going to die today or, yeah. um, you know, things like that. You know, it's just it, – it wraps me in that spiral hole. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so uh, getting through those first 63 pages, you know, it felt very daunting. But, you know, sure. towards the – after I read, um, we read the preface, the forwards, we read, oh, the yeah. doctor's read opinion. everything. After I read the doctor's opinion, um, and I, I actually had read it a few times in different meetings because I was going to so many meetings at that point that I would hear different parts of the doctor's opinion. Yeah. And as an alcoholic, for me, at least, I have to hear things six different times for it to finally yeah. fucking make From sense. Six and that- different people in six different ways. Yep. I love that the big book repeats itself so much because when you finally get the message (laughs) um, and yeah, so, you know, I get to the 63 pages, we set up a time. He walked me through the first three steps in about two hours or so. um, And I felt like, wow, okay. That wasn't as nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was already (laughs) shit that I had already decided, you know, like I, I really came back this time. Like, no, I'm done. Now help me with the solution. What was I missing that entire three years that I was sober, Mm -hmm. that I was still a fucking asshole all the time, you know? Um, And I also, this time too, uh, the detox place, you know, I told you they told me to detox for seven days and then I could come in and talk to them about the rehab. Um, And when I went in to talk to them, I actually brought my boyfriend with me too. So he could get a vibe for it. Sure. Well, one, we both got really bad vibes from the place. And two, they don't use the steps or the AA program whatsoever. Nope. So nope. I honestly looked at that guy and I was like, dude, I've, I've tried it every way. I've tried that. I've <laughs> I've done all that. Like, no, you don't they, use the steps. I they was blown also, away. Most of the people that are working there are also not in recovery. They're just young kids with bachelor's degrees trying to teach you their form of meditation. I could tell. I I hate to say this, but it's stupid. Yep. It really I'm not was. Big on, I'm not big on treatment anymore because nope. it's not 12 step. It's not based on anything. It's just yep. money grubbing. We can go to detox and AA just fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, you know, my- yeah. Does treatment help? Yes. But it's very expensive. The right treatment's very expensive. Yeah. I I think, you know, 
medically detoxing and then yeah like you said the aa that's sure. really what what we need that's that's um, what we did or or maybe aa is not for you so you know we go find you a different group may celebrate recovery where you know where there's no structure you know or yeah there's dharma Free recovery thinkers. there's well variety there's there's a lot of places to go yeah, there's uh I just came across free thinkers and it's pretty much a whole agnostic form of it. Yeah. And that, that was cool to find figure out. Not that yeah. I like, you know, I'm yeah. not on that level, but I'm I've always been a pretty open minded person and I really like to learn as much as I can so I sure. can come up with actual, you know, an actual either opinion or decision based on the more information I have, you know. Yeah. And so I think that's why I'm really starting to explore every avenue of AA right now. Um, and so, yeah, so I uh, worked the steps with him. He, he launched me into step four and that was really awesome. And he broke step four down into like six parts. Um, so that way I wasn't. Yeah. So that way I wasn't doing it all in one sitting. Um, and I got through step four. I did step five, six, and seven. And, you know, pretty much started having that spiritual experience where my yeah. thinking started yeah. changing. Um, and once my thinking started changing and I started helping others and finished the steps and sponsoring other people, that's when it all really just changed. That's you know, it. It, I realized life wasn't as bad as I thought it was all these years, you know, yeah. and granted, I'm only 29, but luckily I'm only 29 and I get to hopefully experience some life without yeah. misery. Hey, I've heard your what story. You, you, you had a bottom, you know, and that's why I never say rock bottom anymore, because it's it's a bottom. It's a decision. Have you had enough? Are we done? Can we move forward? That's that's what we're coming down to. Um, yeah. But I will plant that seed. Um, my main mission in life is to ruin your drinking career. And I'm really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your shirt on, buddy. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> we're doing a little work. We're doing a little work with the kiddo. <laughs> need to be changed uh yeah so change in thinking though that really is what it's all about because you're able to start thinking clear um mm -hmm. and making you know just non-selfish actions and decisions and you're not always thinking about how you're gonna benefit from something Correct. um I, I'm not a huge fan of baby showers, but even today at the baby shower that I went to this morning, you know, once I was there and present and yeah. playing with his and nephews, all of my selfish bullshit went out my head and it yeah. made me realize, you now this is why I come is to be an auntie, not to yeah. get sort of satisfaction out of, oh, this isn't a party, you know, but yeah. Yeah, so it's one of those things where it's just, it, it opens up so many doors, and I've never, I've had friends, but I have so many real friends now that I'm yeah, in AA. It's, friendships in AA are different. Yeah, and now I don't see my grandfather as just some weirdo Jesus lover yeah. who's sober. I'm like, okay, no, he was having a, a spiritual I experience. I get it. <laughs> Yeah, he was having a spiritual experience, making his amends, living his life, and yep. I, I want that. I want to pass it on. Yeah, um, and I want to live free as well. And you know, and uh, my sponsor told me uh, when we went through steps one, two, and three, uh, he had me turn to page. I think it's one thirty-three where. It what god yeah we had a little difficulty yes. there folks so i had to pause it but we are good now thank you thank you um but yeah like i was saying for me if god's will is to be happy joyous and free that's mm -hmm. not just me that's everyone and i right. should be spreading good good karma and good vibes and 
you know, just trying to be a good human is how I'm looking at it these yeah. days. So. Now, well, from this story, this is what I hear. We we started out as a very lonely person, right? And we talked about loneliness a lot. And then, uh, and then you found some other people in your life that started to get rid of that loneliness, right? And then you weren't lonely anymore. And now you teach other people how not to be lonely. Exactly. Now you're now we're the hope. When you said neither do we in our past, we don't shut the door on our past. We don't. Um, and and that comes with you know getting rid of loneliness. Yeah, every experience that I've been through has led me here, and now I can be of service. And exactly, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been able to be of service if I hadn't gone through these experiences. Exactly. Everything that led me to today made me and I wouldn't change it at all. And one other thing, too, that I like to keep in mind in this recovery process is that, you know, no one moment can be recreated. So even this moment right. right here between me, you and everyone else that listens, yes, it will be recorded but it will never be recreated nope, exactly that way or even a moment or a feeling. And that's just yeah. a beautiful way to embrace yeah. what you're in at yeah. that time. And, and that's a, that's a really cool point to end on because when I took that first drink at 14, I chased that moment for the rest of my life for it to never happen again. Then I come into the program and I start doing the work and new things happen. The pink cloud is just a happiness you've never felt before. Okay. Yeah. You get one because you can never feel something new twice. Okay. So that pink cloud only happens once. The rest of the time, you're just in a good mood. So take it. <laughs> you know, um, thank you very much for taking your time. We've had some technical difficulties. We got through those at the beginning. Um, Amber and I were going to make this thing happen today. So, <laughs> yeah, actually, we were like, okay, we're going to try Zoom. If it doesn't work, then we won't do it. God, fine. So, but it worked out. I'm glad it worked out. I was excited with it being four months for me today. Yeah. And... Oh, today, four months. Congratulations. Woo. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's was a legitimate exciting. one to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my significant other, he's the one that usually gives me my chips now. Good. So that's, it was really nice to wake yeah. up and, and get I, that. I saw the other one that he bought for the other person. It was nice, man. So you should probably yeah. let Scott do the chip picking from now on. Well, I picked out the one for the 25 years. Oh, did you? Good yeah. job. I liked it. It's Thank pretty, you. We got it. lunch with her tomorrow. I'm really uh, excited. You look excited. All right. Thank you, everyone, and especially Amber for taking your time today. You know, as alcoholics, we do we do um, feel a loneliness that other people just don't really understand. So it is important for us to let other people know that we're lonely. Um, and that's what's great about podcasting and telling our stories. It actually brings other people hope because then we can sit down and listen and look for the similarities instead of the differences. Um, I always thought that I would, that I'd just be who I was. And uh, you all get it. So, all right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been a raw recovery, uh, trudging together podcast. Uh, I love you. Peace out. And have a day. <laughs>